So imagine a guy is pulled over for speeding on the H3. And he says to the police officer, but officer, I need to be true to myself. And I just don't feel authentic going 55. <laughs> when I drive, I listen to my heart. And this morning, my heart told me, go 90. So officer, it wouldn't be right for you to impose your rules on me. When I'm driving, I have to be free. <laughs> or imagine there's a, a woman at home and someone from the IRS knocks on her door. And the IRS agent says, it's come to our attention that you haven't paid taxes in 10 years. And this woman says, I understand that paying taxes may work for some people. But for me, it would feel kind of hypocritical. If I'm going to give gun money to the government, it needs to come from the heart. Or I'm, I'm not really being true to myself. So don't impose your rules on my money. I have to be free. Or imagine a man is dating a woman and he says to her, I just feel that for me, being faithful to only one woman would be kind of confining. Uh, I've learned to get in touch with my inner core self. And when my inner core self sees an attractive woman, it wants to get to know her. I'm sure you'll understand. I've got to be true to myself. Now, today, as we continue our Questions of Faith series, we're asking the question, what gives you the right to tell me how to live? We're asking this question because there are thoughtful inquirers who look at Christianity and wonder, why are there so many rules? If I were to become a Christian, would I have to follow all of them? Would I have to stop having fun? Or, or, or worse yet, would I have to stop being me? In other words, is Christianity a straitjacket? Now, I take it as a given that each and every one of us wants to flourish. That each and every one of us wants to experience freedom and life. I, I don't know anyone who says, I'm just hoping that next year I can be a little bit more depressed. <laughs> Fingers crossed that my health will start to deteriorate. Thank God for this addiction that's destroying me. Don't know anyone who says those kinds of things. We all want to experience freedom. We all want to flourish. So how do we? For a long time, Western society told folks, if you want to flourish, it's important that you follow the rules. And everyone follows somebody's rules, right? If you didn't follow any rules, you wouldn't last a day at work or at school. If you didn't follow any rules, you wouldn't last five minutes on the road or on a basketball court. Everybody follows somebody's rules. As a society, we can't live without rules, yet we often find ourselves debating which rules are good and which are not. Many years ago, we looked at our financial sector and said there are too many rules. So we loosened the rules. We loosened the regulations. And then our economy tanked because banks and other institutions did all kinds of reckless things. So we went back, right? And we established more rules, more regulations. And now we're at a point where people are asking, hey, wait a second. Are there too many rules, right? Are there too many regulations? Often we try to fix our problems with rules. But does that work? When you think of uh, the political issues that show up in the headlines today, terrorism, climate change, immigration, opiate addiction, gun violence, manufacturing jobs, all of these issues that come up, one of the questions is how effective is our rules in dealing with this issue? Can we solve this problem with a change in rules, a change in law? We know that rules are helpful, right? I mean, we have a rule that at a red light, you stop, right? And you have to stay there until it turns green. I mean, how oppressive is that? 
But you have to sit there until it turns green. And I think we would all agree that that is actually safer for pedestrians and for drivers, so we affirm that rule. But we also know that rules alone can't solve our problems. I think everyone would agree that, that, that we have certain health issues in America. Uh, one of them is the number of Americans that are overweight. How do we solve that with rules? I know uh, the mayor of New York, New York City, this was a while back, but they said, you know, you cannot sell a soda over 16 ounces in the city of New York. Does that make people healthier? Are there free refills? <laughs> rules alone cannot make a person lead a healthier life. And, and that's because rules are by nature restrictive. Rules tend to define what we cannot do. When we lived in San Diego, we got one of those above ground pools. Anyone had one of those? You know, it was actually pretty big, right? It even had a ladder, but it's above ground pool. We put it in our back patio and the kids loved it. I mean, they would play in that thing every day. And pretty soon we, we realized we need some rules for this pool, right? For all the kids that are showing up. And so Cindy put up this list of rules right up where the pool was. It had like no running, no pushing, no peeing. No diving. Like all these rules, and then the very last rule was have fun. <laughs> now, that last rule did not fit with the other rules. Have fun is not a rule. We cannot turn to our son Mike and say, You were not having fun today. You're grounded. <laughs> it, it doesn't work that way. Rules set the boundaries of acceptable behavior but they don't inspire us to pursue creativity or beauty or laughter. Rules don't empower us to flourish. Now, the Apostle Paul makes this point in Romans 7, where he says, in essence, the law, God's law, serves a good purpose. It shows us right from wrong. And then he says, for example, I wouldn't have known what coveting was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So the law shows me what coveting is. But the problem with the law is that it doesn't empower me to stop coveting. It points me in the right direction, but it doesn't give me the ability to get there. Rules alone can never empower us to flourish. Yet oftentimes Christians are associated with rules. My grandmother, Granny, as we called her, was an old-school Methodist. And as an old-school Methodist, she didn't dance, she didn't play cards, she definitely didn't drink alcohol. These were the rules that Christians in her circles followed. Now, for a long time, Western society in general and the, the church in particular said, hey, if you want to flourish, you need to follow the rules. And I believe that what we see in our culture today, this kind of postmodern culture that we've talked about many times, is a reaction to the rules and, and a backlash to the rules. Today, many folks say the key to flourishing isn't following somebody else's rules. The key to flourishing is being true to yourself. How many of you have heard that? The key is being true to yourself, looking inside and discovering your real identity, being authentic and following your heart. This is the air we breathe today. I mean, listen to pop music. Be yourself and don't allow anyone to stop you from doing that. That, that is the message of so many songs and movies. I remember one year our son Micah, he got a class CD where every student in the class put a song in it and then they gave the CD to the whole class. It's actually a great idea. So we're listening, and each song we know, you know is submitted by one of the students. And there was this one song on the CD that was really catchy. It basically said, what you got to be, I got to be me. Say what you got to be, I got to be me. And we listened to this song over and over again. And as I did, I realized this is the anthem of our generation. If I want to flourish, I got to be me. That's the most important thing. Now, I like this song, and I think it has a good message. Don't be controlled by peer pressure. 
But one day I found myself asking, do I really want my children running around saying, Dad, I got to be me? Hmm. Daniel, who said you could eat candy for breakfast? <laughs> Dad, I got to be me. Daniel, <laughs> why were you teasing that boy on the ride home today? Dad, I got to be me. Micah, why do you keep blaming your brother when something goes wrong? Dad, I got to be me. Micah, why did you eat the blueberries when mom hadn't had any? Dad, I got to be me. What if being me means being self-centered? What if being me means being manipulative? What if being me means being greedy? In the 20th century, there were several generations that did what they were told. That included being sent off to fight in two world wars. But in the 60s, there was a generation that said, enough. We don't want to follow your rules. We want to follow our heart. And what our heart wants is the right thing to have because our hearts are good. Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. describes his experience of the 60s in this way. He says, any emphasis on sin startled my generation. We had been brought up to believe in human innocence and virtue. The perfectibility of man was less a liberal illusion than an all-American conviction. The rebel young of those frenzied years had a guileless confidence in the unalloyed goodness of spontaneous impulses. In other words, just do what comes naturally because that's the right thing to do. Now, if you look at our culture today, 40 plus years later, we have a remarkable amount of freedom to do whatever we want. And the result is that we're bound as never before. Addiction to alcohol, addiction to narcotics, addiction to painkillers, addiction to food, addiction to gambling, addiction to video games, addiction to the internet, addiction to shopping. The list goes on and on. As I've mentioned before, I know United Methodist churches that have 30 to 40 recovery groups that meet on their campus every week. And as we all know, whatever we're addicted to becomes our slave. We're controlled by it. We're not free. John Orberg writes, we generally define freedom from, as freedom from external constraints. I've got to be free. I've got an inner voice. I've got to listen to it. Then I find the strangest thing. I'm free to drink as much as I want, and so I do. And then it starts to get a hold of me. It starts to kind of damage my health. It starts to kind of embarrass my kids. It starts to kind of hurt my marriage. It starts to kind of threaten my work. So I try to quit, and then I find I'm not free to not drink. Free to drink as much as I want, but not free to stop drinking. It turns out that my freedom isn't restricted simply by external constraints. It's also restricted by an internal reality that is a kind of brokenness or weakness or dividedness inside me. I want to stop drinking, but I can't. I want to live with a happy, cheerful, optimistic attitude, but I don't. I want to quit yelling at my kids. I, I want to be the kind of person who manages anger really, really well, but I'm not. I'd like to think I have become unselfish, but I haven't. I'm not free. But the freedom I lack is an internal freedom. And this inner lack of freedom is more dehumanizing, more tragic than external constraints. Now, from a Christian perspective, we all lack this internal freedom. And we do so because of something called sin. In Romans 7, Paul describes his experience of sin this way. He says, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate, I do. I have the desire to do what's good, but I can't carry it out. For I don't do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. Can anyone relate to this? Just Paul, right? I can certainly relate. He goes on to say, now I know, now if I do what I don't want to do, it is no longer I who do it, it is sin living in me that does it. 
Paul saying there's this inner battle in me. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. And he says, I'm stuck. Is there anyone who can rescue me? See, sin is the, the, the concept, the, the reality that we've missed the mark. It's the idea that there is a, 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 a bullseye. That's literally what the Greek word for sin means, missing the mark, missing the bullseye. There is a bullseye of how God wants us to live, a bullseye that shows us who we were created to be, our true self made in the image of God. But each of us misses that bullseye because we lack the internal freedom, the, the power, the ability to do that which is good and right. From a Christian standpoint, there's a world of difference between knowing what to do and having the ability to do it. Can I get an amen? amen. I know it's good to exercise three times a week. Does that mean I do it? I know it's good to stop eating uh, fast food and stop drinking Diet Coke. Does that mean I do it? I know it's good to get eight hours of sleep. Does that mean I do it? I know it's good to read the Bible and pray every day. Does that mean I do it? I know it's good to have patience when I'm frustrated with my sons. Does that mean I do it? Christianity isn't about being told how to live. Christianity is about being empowered to live. It's about having the ability to do the right thing. And that ability doesn't come from us. That ability comes from the Holy Spirit, from God's Spirit, as Paul was saying in Galatians 5. God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is so central to a Christian worldview because the Holy Spirit gives us the freedom and the power and, and the strength to live a new life, a better life, the life we've always wanted. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God. The, the Holy Spirit is the life of God which can live in us and lead us. And from a Christian perspective, the way to flourish, the way to truly be me, is to live by the Spirit as Paul puts it in Galatians 5, to receive and be led by the Holy Spirit. Now, practically speaking, how do we do that? I want to mention two ways, and they're very basic, but I think they're helpful to hear. The first is to ask for the Spirit, <laughs> to invite the Spirit into our lives. In Luke 11, here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, If you then, though you are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Just as we like to give our children good gifts, God delights in giving us the best gift of all, himself, the Holy Spirit. Ask for the Spirit, not just once, but again and again. I have a friend and mentor named Mick, and for years now, he has made it a spiritual practice at least once a week to sit in stillness and to invite the Spirit to fill him afresh and to shape who he is becoming. Now, according to Paul, here is what the Spirit produces in us. Here's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Wow. Sound good? I mean, those are the marks of a flourishing life. And those aren't marks that come to us by following rules. Those qualities come to us by receiving the gift of God's Spirit. The more we live by the Spirit, the more this fruit grows in us, and that brings us to our second step. First, to ask for the Spirit. Second, to keep in step with the Spirit. Now, later on in Galatians 5, Paul puts it this way. He writes, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I love that imagery. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, I have a bad habit with my family. I tend to walk ahead of them. 
Anyone else? Any guys with me here? Like, I tend to walk ahead of my kids. Like, come on, hurry up, you know? And I have to keep going back, right? I'm trying to, I should walk with them. But, you know, so Micah, he's in seventh grade, holding hands, days are over. <laughs> Those days are over, but Daniel, he's in fourth grade. And every now and then, Daniel will still reach out his hand and grab my hand and we'll walk hand in hand. And when we walk hand in hand, we are in step with each other. And those are certainly my favorite walks with him. See, Paul urges us to keep in step with the Spirit. Just picture that image. Elsewhere, he calls us to walk by the Spirit. Once we've asked the Spirit into our lives, we still have a choice each day of whether we'll follow the lead of the Spirit or close ourselves off to the Spirit. In Ephesians, Paul writes, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes, do not quench the Spirit. In other words, let the Spirit do its thing. Don't fight it. Don't put out the fire. Go with it. Don't resist it. Now, if you have come to Jesus and asked for the Spirit, the Spirit is there. The Spirit is already at work in you. As Ortberg points out, the Spirit is bigger than you. He is stronger than you. He's more patient with your failures and your inadequacies than you are. The Spirit is committed to helping you 24-7. So Paul says, in a sense, your job is simply to not get in the Spirit's way. Don't quench the Spirit. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ isn't just about following the rules that are found in the Bible. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ is about being led by the Spirit. And as Mahe likes to remind us, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The great thing about following Jesus is that that turn toward freedom, that turn toward flourishing is always available. No matter what choices we've made, no matter where our path has led us this last week, this last month, this last year, there's always that next step toward flourishing. There's always that next step toward simply saying yes to the Spirit and going in the way that the Spirit is leading us. That next step toward the person God made you to be, is always waiting. It's available this morning, this week, no matter what you've done or how bad you've messed up. This week, God invites us to walk in step with His Spirit so that we can flourish. Let's pray. I want to give you just a, a moment to reflect on this question and just to turn to God and ask, God, what is one step I can take this week toward becoming the person you made me to be? God, what's my next step? I would encourage you to share that with someone that you know this week. You know, it really, it takes community, the support of others to flourish. That's why God gives us a Christ-centered ohana. And God, as we turn to you and invite you to lead us in that next step towards your freedom, towards your life, towards your flourishing, God, we recognize that there is that internal <laughs> brokenness in us. God, we, we acknowledge that there are plenty of times where we know the good to do, we know what to do, but we simply don't have the ability to do it. So as a church family, we turn to you and we invite your Holy Spirit to have your way in us. Come and fill us. Fill us for the first time, Holy Spirit. Fill us anew this morning with your very presence, your very power, God. Come. Come. We invite the Holy Spirit to lead us. God, we want to walk in step with the Spirit this week. 
We cannot do that on our own. Please empower us to do that this week. And God, we come to you knowing that you love us and that you care about us. And we come to you as a loving parent with our needs and our requests, our hopes and our fears. And God, we have some prayer requests we want to bring you as a church family. Joyce Robel has a prayer request here for her, her daughter-in-law's father, who is in Castle Hospital. God, we pray for Jack Ward this morning. God, we pray for hope for Art Bauckham. God, we pray for Miss Jager. It's a prayer from Jack for Miss Jager at my school that the kids would be better behaved. We pray for Miss Jager, God. Give her strength and we pray for a class that can work together well and listen to each other and be well behaved together. God, we want to pray for Paul Darlington who is fighting cancer and who just had surgery. God, we pray for your grace to be in all of us. We pray for family and friends who are going through serious health challenges from Dayton and Linda Holt, for Sister Beverly Cannon, friends Alan, Elise, Bert, Richard, and Susan. God, we also want to pray for strength and healing for the Oliver family in New York City and uh, for Amber Musser's high school friend, Melissa, God, who suddenly lost her husband this week, leaving two twin boys, age five, behind. God, we pray for Melissa. We pray that you would comfort her and that you would strengthen her. God, that you would surround her with love and support during this time. And God, we want to continue to pray for strength for Paul Rhodes and pray that his lungs would strengthen to get off the ventilator, Lord God. And God, we want to pray for Stephen as he undergoes his third procedure on his liver. God, we hold up these prayer requests as a way of holding up these people and asking for your spirit to strengthen, to support, to heal them. And God, we offer all these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.